And Ghana is 66 years old. Hello there, you're watching the Pulse on the Joy News channel. Coming up this afternoon, President Akufuado promises to restore Ghana's economy to its uh, past glorious days as the country marks 66 years of breaking free from colonial rule. We'll get to you the very latest uh, from that event. Meanwhile, former President John Romani Mahama is taking a swipe uh, at government for making the Independence Day celebration a partisan one. We'll hear from the presidential aspirant of the NDC who's taking uh, and stoking more controversy on his promise to scrap the ex Gresha payment when voted back into power. I mean, our pressure is mounting on government as we speak on uh, all fronts from the various health associations uh, as the groups are demanding an immediate supply of three essential vaccines required for child vaccination, which is now in short supply across uh, public hospitals in the country. All right, so essentially it means that we are looking at it in a way that there's funding for it, so we budget or we set money aside for it, and that money is protected, so it's sort of fenced. There's a fence around it. You don't touch it under any circumstances. If you're looking it for money in from... the past or the... Well, well, well... well. <laughs> We'll get uh, you the very latest uh, on that situation. Also coming up ahead, the latest uh, episode of our coverage on dangers on the motorway. Uh, we're talking uh, to pedestrians and motorists who are calling for the construction of pedestrian walkways on the Accra Tema motorway. We'll get you all of that, that plus more coming up here on The Pulse. The Pulse, as always, is brought to you by Global Communities, Dignity, Lua, Affordable, Safe Sanitation. Don't forget that we're on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV Channel 144. This is The Pulse. I am blessed with that. Welcome to the program. We're back with details shortly. I am determined to fix it. That's the assurance from President Akufando, who is uh, promising to address the economic challenges confronting the nation. Uh, Ghana's economy is at the brink of collapse as the nation is grappling to secure a crucial $1.7 billion external debt restructuring uh, with uh, the People's Republic of China in order to pave way for that much needed deal with the International Monetary Fund. While speaking today at the 66th Independence Day celebration, the president of the country called for unity and collective efforts in restoring Ghana to the path of prosperity. Yes. I'm very much aware of the current difficulties confronting our nation and we are working hard to resolve them. But maybe we should also count our blessings in how together we are managing the difficulties. We all see the images around the world here in Ghana we have not had any fuel queues. We have not suffered shortages of food and essential items or the catastrophe of Dubuso. Undoubtedly, major global developments have had a negative impact on our domestic economic performance. We have witnessed historic highs in global inflation and food prices, rising global interest rates triggered by tightening of monetary policy of central banks across several ad advanced economies to tame rising inflation. An energy crisis with crude oil prices reaching unprecedented highs at one point, at one point above $120 a barrel. The strengthening of the United States dollar against all other currencies. The tightening of global financing conditions, especially for emerging markets and developing economies and the large-scale disruption of the global supply chain. These phenomena have manifested in Ghana in the form of the depreciation of our currency, the decline in gross international reserves, high inflation, elevated debt burden, significant fiscal stress, constrained domestic and external financing, and reduced GDP growth. It is these that have brought hardships upon our people. Government has deployed a number of fiscal interventions to help bring relief to Ghanaians. And I'm confident that sooner rather than later, we will see significant results of relief and recovery.
Well, so that's uh, the president speaking in the Volta region. Meanwhile, scores of residents of Nalarigo, Gambaga and Walewale in the northeast region invaded various grounds on uh, this uh, Independence Day celebration in their parts of the country uh, with placards, uh, of course, wearing red bands uh, in protest against the government over what they call uh, its uh, government's meddling in the Boko chieftaincy disputes. The overlord of the traditional area and president of the regional House of Chiefs uh, and uh, some others also refused uh, to grace the event as part of that protest. Uh, this was the event uh, uh, that characterized uh, the celebrations uh, in the Cheriponi district due to some insecurity uh, situations happening there. There's more in this report by our correspondent Ilya Sotanko. A nation divided cannot stand. A people so divided cannot also stand. We therefore need to be conscious of our actions and reactions that constitute a serious threat to the peace we are enjoying. These threats are mainly related to either land or chapters. I therefore want to use this opportunity to call on all of us to live in peace and in unity. It behoves all to preserve and protect the peace that we are enjoying. We may have differences in opinion on matters of mutual interest, but these differences should not and must not lead to conflicts. The minister was speaking after inspecting the parade which was made up of largely students and security personnel in the area. Mr. Zakaria also offered his commendation to the security agencies for securing the chiefs and people of the region. I want to give all the assurance that the region is very peaceful and shall continue to be, thanks to the security agencies for securing the keys of the Northeast region. I want to urge all to go about your legitimate daily duties without let or hindrance. At the end of the day, we shall come out of this situation better, stronger, and people united for a better future. This year's event, however, was celebrated differently in the region as some residents invaded the venues of the parade in Nalirgu, Gambaga and Waliwali to stage protests against the government. The king of Mamprugo and his elders were also not in attendance. The protesting residents also took part in the march as they brandished their placards with several inscriptions calling on the president and his government to stop meddling in the Boko skin dispute. The protest is in connection with the government's rejection of the new Boko Naba, Na Sheriga Sidu Abari, and the subsequent attempt to arrest the Mamprugu king for the enskiment. In Nalirugu, the protest was led by the Nalirugu Youth Association. The group spokesman, Mahama Yamusa, spoke to Joy News. We however decided to use this opportunity to register our displeasure with the attitude of the president toward the people of Mount Purugu. We are not going to leave any stone and turn to make sure that the Boku Nava is sent home and uh, uh, live with these people. Boku Nava, Sherga, Abari, Sebi. He is the one that is recognized by the traditional authority of Mount Purugu. Boku is for Mount Purugu. Boku is not of non The Nauru is a law of every citizen. He believes in his authority and he does what is expected of him. He doesn't go into any place. Mama, the new order for the arrest of our two women. The new order for the arrest of our two women. What is that? What is that? We are allowed for you. If you think that you want to be your evidence, we will not buy. We will not agree. Ilias Sutanko. Reporting for Joy News. All right, let, let's uh, go back to the northeast uh, region. Ilyasu Tanko, our northeast correspondent, is joining us back. Uh, Ilyasu, what's the latest um, in the area where you are? Uh, Elias, we're unable to hear you, but, but I was just talking about the security situation there. Of course, we've seen uh, some of these uh, videos that you sent to us, uh, the demand from residents there on how uh, the conflict uh, happening in their place could be resolved. It's beginning to mar the uh, independence anniversary as well. But tell us, what's the mood right now and how are the authorities dealing with the issue? Well, res the residents uh, think that the president and the, his government are disregarding the uh, article, the provisions in the Constitution, Article 
2770 and 277, uh, they believe that the Mamprugo overlord owes the Mamprugo traditional area, and he has the right to enskin any chief to any part of this particular traditional area. And they believe that it was within the rights of the Mamprugo overlord to enskin a chief for the Bokpo traditional area. And so the subsequent rejection of government uh, to that particular um, uh, enskinment by the Mamprugo overlord is what has triggered this particular protest. And like you saw in the videos, uh, this is what happened in the town of Nalirgo, Gambaga, and Wale Wale. The residents uh, invaded the parade grounds. Mm. And as you see them welding placards and wearing red banners. And so they also took part in the month. And after that, they spoke to the media, expressed uh, their concerns, and uh, they are calling for the president and his government to stop meddling in the Boko chieftaincy. In the Cherponi district, as you know, over the weekend, there was some renewal of communal violence in that particular area. And so authorities decided not to go ahead with uh, this particular celebration. And so in the Cherponi district, uh, this event did not come off. And but, but the other part of the area, like the Bunkurgu Nakpanduri district, as well as the Mamprugu Muaduri district, the event uh, went on successfully without any event. Mm. And uh, have we heard from, for instance, the Regional uh, Security Council on, on what they're doing to deal with, 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 with the issues? So you heard the Regional Minister uh, giving that strong assurance that despite the difficult security situation, the, his outfit and other stakeholders mm. uh, were working seriously to ensure that they restore calm. And as uh, uh, yesterday, for instance, there was also another uh, shooting around the uh, North Gunja and the Manpro West Mamprosi area there. So the regional minister saying they are well aware of the difficult nature of the security situation in the region. And he's working uh, with the stakeholders to ensure that there's calm in the region. Uh, and how about the traditional rulers as well? Because uh, you, as you indicated, some of them boycotted that event as a, as a silent protest to what's happening in the Northeast region. Have they put out any statement? Well, the initial plan was to was for a, a total boycott, uh, but it took the overlord himself to come out to tell the, the youth. We had had a coalition of chiefs and youth group who had issued the statement calling for a total boycott of this particular event. And the overlord came out to say, this is a national event, this is a state event, it has nothing to do with this particular government, so let's participate. Uh, but he gave his support to the fact that people could go there and weld black cars just so uh, to, mm. to to express their yeah, discontent with whatever is happening in the area. So uh, at the moment, because of uh, uh, the the situation in Boko, uh, uh, the, the, the authorities, the chiefs, I must say, are very angry with the government now. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that uh, from the information that we have gathered from the Overlord, his doors are open for to collaborate with the regional security council to ensure that uh, they restore calm in the northeast region. Okay then, uh, Elias, so thank you. Uh, and of course, we'll be getting back uh, for some more updates. Uh, meanwhile, talking about the uh, Ghana at 66 celebrations and in Krumai's party, the PNC is asking President Akufado and his government to deal with the pockets of violence happening up north. Plus, uh, resolve the economic challenges facing this country as one of the surest ways of building back better. Let me bring in now Shaq Awud, who speaks for uh, the PNC. Thank you so much sir, for your time here on the poll. So, uh, let's start off, uh, of course, uh, from the background of what's happening in the northeast region, for instance. It feeds into your concerns about uh, what you describe as general insecurity in the country, and uh, you feel that this is associated with the economic hardship in the country. Uh, so where do we start off from in terms of finding the solutions? Well, bless. I think that the independence of Ghana was conceived by Ankoma and his compatriots who sacrificed and toiled at the peril of their lives to ensure that Ghana broke the yoke of colonialism. Indeed, 
when the fight and the struggle for independence was ongoing, it was just not about the capacity for Ghana to take itself out of the control of the Western imperialists. It was also envisaged that Ghana and Africa, for that matter, we were capable, as Nkrumah said, of managing our own affairs. And this meant that we had the capacity, just like the Western colonial masters, to be able to take decisions in the best interest of the people of Ghana and Africa, for that matter. And that, and that also included the ability to take decisions that would improve upon the lot of the people of Ghana. Now, 66 years down the line, the question everybody is asking is, is this the Ghana envisaged by our forebears? Indeed, this cannot be the Ghana envisaged by our forebears. Because the kind of foundation that had been laid at independence in terms of social amenities, in terms of physical infrastructure, in terms of the social cohesion that we needed as a people, that is incomparable to what we have today. Like we just singled out, we are all aware of the, the disturbances in the Northeast region. It is partly as a result of the economic quagmire that we find ourselves in, that out of disappointment and out of despondency, people decide as it were, or people are pushed by their circumstances and the, the peculiar situation surrounding them to engage in some of these untoward uh, issues that amount to a breach of the security and the peace within the, 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 the Northeast region. And so we think that if the government of the day were able to do things in such a manner that people would be assured of a certain modicum of living, people were assured of being able to, to find a place to lay their heads. People were assured of being able to find three square meals a day. People were assured of, of, of all of those basic necessities of life. It would amount to cutting down on the propensity for them to engage in some of these, excuse my language, some of these conflicts, which in my opinion amount to nothing but as a result of, of the living conditions that the people find themselves in. Uh, but, but then as a political party, uh, I mean, uh, the, the president is giving his word, is giving assurances that what we need now is, is unity. He's beginning to act on his words, isn't it? Well, I am not sure that Ghana is divided. I am not sure that we have a divided Ghana. Ghana is as united as it has always been. But the point is, once we have chosen for ourselves a system of government, a system of government that allows for us to go to the polls every four years and entrust the destiny of this country into the hands of a political party which forms government, into the hands of a president who constitutes his government by making various appointments with a covenant a covenant to improve upon the lot of the people. And within that four years, if we do not see any improvement within that four years, if we rather see a certain level of retrogression within that four years, we rather see that the president and his government has not been able to deliver on the promises that they by themselves made at the, to the people of Ghana, then the, the, the issue confronting us should not be that of disunity. The issue should be that of a call for us to be honest enough to accept the, the, the responsibilities placed on us and, and, and to fashion out ways by which we'll be able to meet the aspirations and the dreams of the people of Ghana who queued under the scorching sun to vote for people to become president, who went ahead to appoint ministers who went ahead to do various kinds of appointments with the singular hope of improving upon the living conditions of the Ghana. And so when the president talks about the calls for unity, of course, unity is important. But at this material moment, I am not sure that it is this unity or it is division within the Ghanaian society that is the 
that is the cause mm. of the deplorable living conditions that we find ourselves in as a people. Okay, uh, now going forward for, for the PNC, you have some recommendations for, for the government to, to consider. What, what are these key considerations they need to make at this moment? Well, blessed. This thing has been said over and over again. You can't keep doing things the same way and expect to get different results. If we agree that we find ourselves in a very tight corner to the extent that we have been downgraded economically and financially, to the extent that the, 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 the financial space, the physical space for Ghana as an economy has been conscripted, and people are saying that let us look at the, the, the alternatives available. What steps can we take to improve upon this, the fiscal space? What can we do? Because there are two sides to every economy. You have the revenue side and you have the expenditure side. And so if as a country we are unable to raise the kind of revenue that can meet the expenditure that we run as a country, what can we do? It means that we have to read the revenue aspect and rather tackle the expenditure aspect because you choose what kind of expenditure you can engage in as a country or otherwise. So people are saying that why would our president not take steps to ensure that we cut down on government expenditure? And one of the ways by which we could cut down on government expenditure is by way of the, 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 the weight bill that we have coming from the size of government, whether from the Flagstaff House, whether for in terms of ministries and ministers, whether in terms of corporations and institutions and government agencies and all of that. Our president is not listening. When the president does not listen, but rather things that people who have invested their life savings yes. in government bonds should rather voluntarily, out of will, come and say that we want to forfeit those bonds in deferment so that we can allow for government to organize itself before they can pay us the dividends. That will be problematic. So we think that the president and his government ought to listen. Let them take pra practical and pragmatic steps that would ensure that they are able to cut down on the size of government, which undoubtedly would impact the expenditure on maintaining mm. the government officials that we have. Mm. Beyond that, we are at the doorsteps of the IMF again. Bless, I am not an economist, but I know for sure that this is going to be about the 17th time that Ghana is going to go, Ghana is going to the IMF. It has been the same IMF that has advised us over and over again. And so when we enter the ditch, who is partly to blame for our inability to, to navigate ourselves out of well, that? Well, just on that who point, the, that the president says he's well aware of that. We we're doing so well. We've gone down. He has promised to fix the problem. And, and he's asking that you come on board. As a political party, are you on board? Well, we have always been on board. We have always been on board as a political party because we are a party who believes that it is not only upon occupying the seat of government that you can contribute to nation building. That is why political parties promulgate what we call manifestos. So if we were to go, to take, to go through the manifestos of the PNC over the years, you would see the kind of brilliant policy positions that the PNC has always come, 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 come out with. Mm. And some of these have found their way into the national life of the people of Ghana. And so the PNC has been a mainstay of Ghana's governance architecture since 1992 when we were formed as a political party. And this time cannot be different. But we are saying that the president should be a listening president. The president should listen to the many calls by the good people of Ghana for him to take a critical look at the government expenditure, especially the fruitless expenditure, which adds nothing mm. as far as growing this economy is concerned. All right. Ishak Aoud, thank you. Uh, he speaks uh, for the PNC. Uh, they're, of course, sharing their concerns about uh, Ghana at 66. Well, it's not just the PNC that has concerns about the Independence Day celebration. Former President John Dramani Mahama says he's boycotted the national event, uh, particularly the one happening in the Volta region, because the ceremony is now being politicized by government. I just came from the Volta region. And just when I was leaving, they were preparing to celebrate the Independence Day. I stopped going to the Independence Day 
because it's become a party jamboree. I went to Tamale, they told GBC to take the camera off me. They bust their supporters in and fill the whole stadium. When I got into the stadium, the place was quiet. I went and sat. They gave me some corner somewhere and went and sat there. And they occupied the days. And any of them who came in, hey, hey. And I said, I don't want to be part of this party jamboree. Independence is a solemn national celebration. We should celebrate it at the Independence Square. And everybody who wanted to come could come. Today they bust their supporters in. They have party flags. They are wearing party t-shirts. I don't want to be part of a party jamboree. Nkrumah got us independence. I'm an Nkrumahist. I will attend an Independence Day any day if it's not hijacked by one party. Because it should be a national day for all of us. So I'm not going to be in hold tomorrow because I don't want to be part of an MPP jamboree. You watch what will happen tomorrow. They'll bust their people in and occupy that whole place. And so, but in any case, why should I be celebrating Independence Day? And as Nana said, today if you are a mother and you take your child to the hospital for vaccine, three vaccines are shot. First time since the Fourth Republic. So what are we celebrating independence when our children cannot get vaccines? My maternal sibling suffered from polio. He was crippled by polio. And so I know what polio is. And we've gained strength in the fight against polio. Fewer children are getting crippled by polio. Today our children cannot get polio vaccines, cannot get measles vaccines. And as long as we don't get it, the diseases are going to begin to spread again. And you're going to celebrate 66 years of independence. You celebrate it. I'm not going to be part of it. I was speaking last night at a party event uh, organized by the NDC. So let's stay on that because the president, uh, former president, as he is, is stoking more controversy on his promise to scrap the payment of ex Croatia for his appointees when voted in, into office. That matter has become a political one with the NPP side uh, chiding the president for double standards. Last night when he spoke, uh, he also talked about his political future. Jude to spend 15 million Ghana cities on ties and batteries. And then you're asking them to take a haircut on their independent power producers, 30% haircut on their independent power producers and on their international debt. And then you can spend 15 million Ghana cities on ties and batteries. I mean, it's, it's just a comedy. This government is Jaguar Jokers. And until the president wakes up and takes control, he must take control and command. You have all those people walking around who call themselves presidential staffers and special assistants, thousands of them all over the place, writing stupid things on social media. And I say, ex Gracia, let's cancel it. It's not the first time I'm saying it. I said it in 2016. I said, if we win, we'll cancel ex Gracia. I said it. Go Google, and you see, I said 2016, before the election, was one of my promises that if we win, we'll cancel it. We didn't cancel it because I didn't win. Okay, well, the official record says that I didn't win. You know, but the point is, I say we'll cancel it, Gracia. If you cancel it, you to say, when we come, we'll cancel it. But why are you insulting me and saying I should refund mine? Would you cancel it or you cancel it? Tell the people of Ghana. But no, bring your, yours first. Okay, now let's bring in Benjamin Kwasha. He's an executive member of the NDC, also a staunch supporter of the John Mahama campaign. Uh, but Benjamin, this is becoming one of the lowest points for some uh, for the John Mahama campaign, knowing that this is the ex-president who had all of the opportunity to do this, and yet he failed. Now we're here, and he's promising to scrap it. It could affect his fortunes to, to lead the NDC, right? 
I don't, uh, blessed. Um, a very good afternoon to you and our cherished uh, viewers. Um, honestly, I don't think that uh, the former president had said anything far from the truth. Um, president Mahama in 2015, 2016 had uh, made it a campaign promise that should he have won that election, he was going to scrap uh, the ex gratia payments. Now, he, he unfortunately, the party lost the election and so um, he couldn't put, put those to, to action. But blessed, you see, um, the president, uh, President Mahama has now made it very clear about how we can all contribute towards ensuring that Ghana becomes a better country. Why am I saying so? Just yesterday, um, we, we realized that President Akufado was not listening to anybody. President Akufado was running this country as if he was running a, a family business. His own party people have stated that without any ambiguity. But now that policy differences are being mentioned by the former president, now that President Mahama has indicated clearly that, look, as the leader of the executive, he had admitted during that interview that there are three arms of government. He has stated clearly that on the aspect that deals with the executive, which he is the executive president, is going to ensure that from his end, those emoluments and payments that goes to the Article 71 holders uh, are, are scrapped. Um, the, 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 the TUC boss also indicated that the, the economic mess we find ourselves in has to do with the, uh, uh, people on the, the uh, uh, payroll that are dead and also Article 71 uh, office holders. I think the president has, has shown us clearly that this is what he's going to do. He said it in 2015, 2016, he lost the election, and he has given Ghanaians the promise. But, but, but why, is John, why is John Mahama running away from the question, the need for him to demonstrate that principle? Return yours first, return your exegesia, or the benefits that you are receiving. Just stop them, and then that will be a demonstration that indeed you, you'd make truth to that promise. But, but he's rather attacking persons who, who are suggesting that to him. Do we, do we as a country engage in retrospective uh, uh, laws? These things happen in the past. President Mahama, the, the, the law governing Article 71 office holders has not been scrapped. The law has not been made that, look, these payments are not going to go forward again. He has stated that he would ensure that it's cancelled. He has received some money. There was an interview President Mahama had, and he told all of us on TV3 that there are a lot of things under Article 71 that he has not received. Not a single journalist has challenged him. Nobody has said he's lying. He even went as far as saying that journalists should come for his bank statement and see whether the allegations being made that a certain 14 million Ghana city was paid to him were true. No, it has not happened. What he is saying is that the law is there. In Ghana, we work with laws. The law has not been abolished. The law has not been cancelled. He is saying, when I have the political mandate and I start as a president of the country, from my backyard, which is the executive board, I would ensure that it's scrapped. And definitely he would do it. President Mohammed is a man of his words. We all know him. And we should stop. You see, the simple okay, thing well, is when, that... when he had the power, I mean, your party, you've been in power before. Uh, you, yeah. You've had the eight-year period. The Constitutional yes. Review co co Committee or Commission uh, did yes. some work on that. John Mahama superintended that uh, as the vice president, then eventually became president. No talk about ex Russia or Article 71. So why now? It's, blessed. our country is not in normal times. Sometimes I ask myself, when our, our, our brothers and sisters in the MPP say, why is he talking about scrubbing ex Russia? We are trying to pro pro do what we can do as a country to protect the public purse. Every CD, every cent counts. So President Mohammed's admonition, it's another way of us making sure that we have prudent expenditure of government resources. Article 71 holders, yes, the law says ABC, but then in real sense, you ask yourself, there are other normal workers that go through the SNIT pension period, and then the other ones will take Article 71 and these huge funds. What he is saying is that the country is not in normal times. If you, as a president, want us all to help, this is another way of helping. Make sure that we cut that expenditure from the executive side. And I don't think President Mama spoke far from the truth. 
No, but, but, but of course, we've had significant economic uh, challenges during the John Mahama Mills era, you agree. Uh, to talk about that IMF program, we were even running on the John Mahama, uh, the yes. energy crisis, the doomsday crisis was another issue that came up. All of these things did not inspire John Mahama to scrap but you remember, you remember that during John, President John Mahama's time as a president, everybody had the chance to contribute towards governing the country. During his time, there was doom so. Today, I hear the president at the 66th Independence Anniversary saying that there's no doom so, but he, he doesn't even have the, 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 the respect to say this doom so was solved by the President Mahama administration. Yes, there were issues under President Mahama's administration, but blessed, were the issues as bad as we are having today in the history of the Fourth Republic? Today, we have shortages of vaccines. Are we in normal times? What is there to celebrate about being 66 years? Are we truly independent? He said, oh, we had a president that said that we were not going to go to the IMF. Forget about it. There are like, uh, homegrown policies. I'm going to make sure. Today, we are knocking at the doors of the IMF. And during the NDC time, we were told that going to IMF, we, we didn't know what to do. Today, the steps to take to even get that reprieve from IMF is becoming a problem from this government. So we should, as Ghanaians, also enlighten ourselves and know that, look, we, we cannot be taken for granted forever. We've, we've all sacrificed to this end. And for the president to, to tell us that he knows about the problems, he's going to fix it, what is he doing to help? What is he doing that makes us all believe that he's definitely going to okay. solve the problem? Let me ask you this question. If I'm an yes. average voter, uh, you walk up to me, promise to scrap uh, as gracious as an ex-president. Yes. Ex-Minister of State, former yes. Member of Parliament. Yes. What will be the average question on your mind? At least there will be that question as to what's demonstrating that commitment yes. from so, your side to scrap it. Yes. So President Mahama comes and asks for your vote and says that I'll scrap ex Gracia. President Mahama will let you know the records are there that in 2015, 2016, he had taken steps. He had stated that if he had won the election, he was going to ensure that ex Gracia is scrapped. This is the same President Mahama who, during the uh, period of Dumso, went to Parliament and told Ghanaians through their representatives in Parliament that I admit that there's a problem with Dumso and I will fix it. I will tell that voter, the average voter, that that man who said in Parliament that I admit that there's a challenge with power and I know it is having dire economic consequences on the people of Ghana, but give me the chance, I'll fix it. He fixed it. So okay, I will well, tell the average big voter that mm, he will again fix the But, but it doesn't appear you, you are convincing a number of Ghanaians, including uh, your former general's deputy general secretary, Koko Anyidoho. We know that he's, a, uh, of course, a stern critic of, of, of the president. But Koko Anyidoho is out on, for instance, Twitter. He says that the president, quote, is lying to the people of Ghana and that there was a uh, I mean, constitutional review commission that was set up. John Mahama was well aware of the recommendations that were made at that time that something ought to be done about Article 71. The sheer hatred that Koku Anido has against the former president is becoming nauseating. Um, you, you is this a matter Koku of hatred? Anido. Why not look at what he's saying? Is, is this a no, matter of Realistically, hatred? it's Koku Anido who a former government appointee. Is he a, a former government appointee? Is he not under Article 71? Has he returned the monies that were given to him? Has he even spoken? In this dire situations, we find ourselves as a country that it is going to be good that we stop as Article 71 holders and return whatever we've been giving back to the state. You see, Koku Anidahu's hatred has made him not to be a firm and decisive person when it comes to real issues. But why not so look at what he's I saying? I don't want to talk about Koku Anidahu mm -hmm. because his hatred for the NDC has made him not to Mind you, this is, this is a former Deputy General Secretary of the party. He, 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 well. he knows he well, he, what, he what he's talking show, about, right? What hasn't he said about former President Mahama? Mm. What didn't he say about General Asiye Dunketia before he became chairman? Koku runs to the media on Twitter, and I'm happy he does it only on Twitter, because the real issues that are to do with bread and butter, he doesn't talk about it. He doesn't say anything about the, okay. those ones, because he's doing his paymaster's job. He okay. wouldn't take him seriously. Right. Well, we, need, we need to go, but, but if John Mahama's campaign may be dented, the fear is that this ex gracia issue will be one of it. You believe so? I don't. I don't. Because 
the party is coming up with the brilliant manifesto that we are all going to see when 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 the NDC elects uh, uh, the flag bearer, and then from there the party will roll out uh, initiatives and programs that will let us all see. But I can assure you that President Mahama walks the talk. Whatever he's saying that he will do, he will definitely do. This is a cap in the feather for President Mahama. It is never going to have a dent on his campaign. Mm -hmm. President Mahama is the only rescuer that will take Ghana out of the economic doldrums that this inept and incompetent Akufuado administration has led us. That is the truth. Okay, then. Uh, let's see what your delegates will say uh, when you go to the Fair. polls in May. Fair. I'm grateful, uh, Benjamin Kwashi, joining us uh, via Zoom. Now, it's uh, also emerging this afternoon that 16 districts in the northern region have recorded cases of measles and shortage of three key vaccines in, the, in some parts of the country is beginning to bite hard. There is pressure on the government from experts and uh, health practitioners on the need to secure three essential vaccines for immunizing our babies in the, in the country. Uh, the Ghana Health Service has already indicated that uh, it expects some supplies in a matter of weeks, but there are fears that there could be a dire consequence for uh, newborn babies. Already 16 uh, districts in the northern region have recorded uh, over 90 cases of measles, and the number is ever increasing. Uh, listen to Dr. Hilda Mantebia Boy, who is the president-elect for the Pediatric Society of Ghana. Now, in the northern region, we have, at the last count, we have more than 100 children who we suspect have measles. And it is very worrying to us. This is something that is ongoing, so data is still being collected. And because of the shortage of the vaccines, we expect that there are likely to be many more children affected by this. So the infection is, more, is likely to rise as the days go by. Uh, is this a situation that's unique to the public hospitals or perhaps it's the entire health system that we're talking about here? We believe it's the entire health system and m some places are affected more than others. But generally, there are shortages of vaccines and these have been reported mm. from both the private and the public sector. Mm. And what we want to do is to carry our listeners along. For those who may not understand the technicalities of it, uh, we've been talking about baby vaccines. There are those who are wondering what's the essence, even in the first place, and what's required for the baby to ensure their efficient development as a, as a toddler. Talking about these technical processes, just break it down for the average viewer or listener out there. What's required for the baby at this stage in terms of the vaccines? All right, so babies are babies and they are born with an immature immune system, if I may put it that way. So their bodies are not strong enough to fight the infections that are in the world or in the environment. And therefore, we will need to introduce some of these vaccines. And in some cases, these are the same germs that will cause the illness, but their strength or their potency has been reduced a bit so that their bodies can mount a response to them, thereby helping them to be stronger and will protect them when they actually come into contact with their real infections in life. And so that is really what immunization is about. And there are a number of illnesses that we vaccinate against in Ghana. We have the polio, the tuberculosis, so the BCG is given for tuberculosis. Then we have the diphtheria, pertussis, and then we have rotavirus, we have tetanus, we have measles, yellow fever. All these are infections or diseases that we vaccinate so our so children mind, I'm, against. I'm counting about five. Uh, your yeah. group is proposing uh, sort of a ring fence, that's how you call it, yes. a ring fence solution to yeah. uh, this whole vaccination process. Explain the mechanism to us and how it will work if, if our authorities take this seriously. All right, so essentially it means that we are looking at it in a way that there's funding for it, so we budget or we set money aside for it and that money is protected, so it's sort of fenced. There's a fence around it. Right. You don't touch it under any circumstances. If you're looking it been for touched money from- in the past or the- Well, <laughs> well, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, so when I shared the ad, you okay. know what? There were people who were asking, where is the EPI? Where is Ministry of Health representatives? Where, where are government, the government officials who are supposed to be answering to this? So they take, 
a large responsibility for this because they are really responsible for ensuring that we have the vaccines. We are stakeholders and as Pediatric Society of Ghana, the children are our priority and mm. we are their chief advocate, yeah. so we'll continue to talk about But if someone is asking expanding. that question, I guess the solution mm. or the answer is very simple. Uh, the fact that, of course, Parliament this week yes. tried to, of course, get the uh, Minister for Responsible for Health, uh, he did not appear. Our indication is that that may happen in this coming week. So that's what we are hoping for. But yes. no comments, no statements as of now. So just to clear that out of the way. Uh, that, that's why we're not hearing from them. Uh, we, we don't know officially what's accounting for this. Uh, it's just a case that are reported. Um, um, I mean, Martis are pointing to the depreciation and other unofficial causes. But we haven't heard from the minister. Yeah, so we are all waiting to hear from them. But at the same time, we know what we need. What we need are the vaccines. And... We can talk, 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 but it's action that we are looking for. So whatever it will take for them to get us the vaccines like today or like yesterday, we need the vaccines because every day we risk having children die from these shortages. We risk them developing disabilities. We risk these infections infecting the elderly, the other people who are also vulnerable. Uh, the Ghana Health Services are assuring that the issues will be dealt with. We'll get some uh, responses for you in our subsequent bulletins. Now to road safety, because pedestrians and motorists who ply the Accra Tema motorway are calling for the construction of pedestrian uh, walkways, including zebra crossings on the highway. For motorists, uh, they observe that accidents involving pedestrians is at an all-time high due to the growing number of uh, communities along the motorway. My colleague uh, Michael Nia Shale has more in the following report. If you traveled down and up the motorway, it will be difficult to miss the number of abandoned vehicles dotted along the highway. The shoulders of the road has become a repair station and quickly attracting numbers by the day. Heavy duty trucks line up the shoulders of the highway, running as far as the eye can see. According to some of the drivers, they have no option than to park here while they wait for documentation for their cargo. Akwesi Techi is one of such drivers. In the port, if you, if you load, there is no place for you to park again. There is no parking place from Tema to this place. And even from this place to uh, Achimota or something, there is no parking place. The place where we can find a comfortable place to park. And our people still haven't ready yet. So uh, unless you find some place to pass so that when your people come, then you go. Their presence here only exposes many motorists to untold danger. And some of the truck drivers even agree. We know that we are disturbing, but we don't, we, we do, we we don't have any, any, any option. While waiting for their documents, some drivers inspect their vehicles and others simply use the time to rest. Some of the drivers explain that some agents at the Tema Harbour offload their cargoes onto their trucks to avoid paying demorage at the port. While parked there, some drivers say they are harassed by some city authorities. Al Hassan Tahiru is a victim. They come, I wasn't inside the car. They, they just came and opened my gate and they took my key. And when they came to my car, I wasn't there. They just opened the gate, they took the key. I don't know where they have. They have Send, Go, send them with the key. More drivers report same. They say it only prolongs their illegal stay at the site. Yesterday he came there and said that he's going to lock the car. And I said no. Then let me move the car. He said, he said no. I shouldn't move the car. And off it. When I started, he, he himself climbed off it and moved the key and go. Why? And we, we don't know where he, where he sent the key. So oh. if we are even ready to go, we can't go. But not But from there to the Bognaza there, there if they are not, they're not parked there, it's good because that place is causing big accidents. He only gave his name as Nathaniel. He observed that the number of accidents around the tow boots have increased since the trucks started parking there. People as is die here is plenty of people because of this parking of the drivers. The parking for the tow boot. So if we give him there some place, let's give him another place to go and park. 
because last year almost about since the time them broke to up to December of last year, almost about 90 people are dying here. Bafaniel says the local authorities are yet to respond to his many appeals. Why? Come and see Bola for the back here. So many Bola. I went to Ashama Municipality, AMC or CPPO, so oh, wow, why, why? There. You throw me away to tell me that I should go police. But the drivers insist if they had an alternative, they would have moved. We are not here for fun. We are just not here for fun. If we have some place to park, we will not be even park here. I don't know other Tema or this place. They should find a place for us. When we park, uh, we finish, we will go, we'll go and park there. Without warning signs, commuters are exposed to higher risk of accident. Seidu is a registered driver with the Ashaman bus terminal. He has been driving on the motorway for at least 10 years. At night, these abandoned trucks become the sleeping area for some bus conductors. But on these dark roads, it's a disaster waiting to happen. And even some cars that we are following, like trucks and others, they don't even have daylight or brake lights, so that you that is following him will know that there is a truck in front of me. Isaac Kwesi Jonobua is unhappy about the situation. And some even don't have the re uh, side reflectors. You understand? So you as a driver going, looking forward, without seeing anything, before you realize you are closer to a truck or a big car, without triangle on the road, it's very hard to apply brake and stand at a spot. So you might finish ending in accident. The woes of pedestrians and commuters on the express highway is far from over. It's been nearly 50 years since the first vehicles plied their cracked on a motorway. It has now become a nightmare to both drivers and commuters. Crossing the motorway is no mean task. Rashida, not her real name, and her daughter have to gather some bravery at least two times a day. The motorway there is very difficult. They should do something about it. I'm afraid. Look at your left, right, then left again and then dash across the street. Many are gripped with fear. Rashida's daughter is no exception. If I'm crossing the way, I find the motorway. Now the car will hit us. I need help. In 2022 alone, more than 30,000 people were killed whilst crossing or whilst using most of the streets in Ghana. And the motorway has contributed its fair share to these statistics. We are told that this is one of the hotspots that have seen many accidents, mainly involving pedestrians and vehicles that are running at top speed. For many, they have escaped death, but many others didn't live to tell their story. Like Rashida and her daughter, thousands cross the motorway at many points. A majority of them come from new settlements that have sprung up along the motorway. This has increased the number of pedestrian crossings. Shiashi is one of such areas. Pedestrians cross the highway to the adjoining communities. The sheer speed of the oncoming vehicles it's scary enough. Moses Samuzu says it takes experience and prayer. If I can cross the road before the car reach my end or get closer to me, this is how I watch. But maybe somebody may never be like may, ne may never have my whole experience. You can feel it, for the person's mind it's like no, I, I can be faster than the car, but the car is an engine faster than you. Can feel knock you down, then that is all. That is the end of your life. Some of the pedestrians wait by the roadside to catch their next bus to their final destination. And some drivers against traffic regulations stop for passengers to alight and board new ones. And the city response team has a tough job to stop that. We are trying to protect the humans. Because this is a highway. Most of the cars' brakes are not good. And you will see the cars parking by 
before he say quickly, the driver will just rush and move in. Sometimes it happens to be accidents and all that, and we are trying to avoid all those things. Richard Kwesi Boni is stationed at the Shashi area. Oh, it's a strong battle we are facing here, though. The challenge is very tough, but we are still trying our best. Sometimes we use the force on them to defend ourselves, for them to move. And so now we have the cramps. When you don't go, we'll cramp your car. Sometimes we direct the passengers that, to the station. Always we have insults from them, but they don't know we are protecting them. Some motorists make driving more risky, often driving across the highway without warning. Frederick Che Amankwa owns a motorcycle. For him, crossing the motorway is a task that requires patience. As you can see, I have to wait till everything is gone because I can't risk my life. I have children in the house and I, I, when I reach here, I remember them. Anything, any mistake I do can take me off. Drivers are concerned as well. Though it is a highway, but we will beg the government to give a zebra crossing at some various places on the motorway. Places like Underbridge, 18 Junction, Coca-Cola and Manet. Those are the serious places that cars is killing people. Between drivers and pedestrians, the motorway has outlived its usefulness. Probably they should have changed this part especially. Looking at the surroundings here, now buildings are scattered around the motorway and it is not helping. I think that, that it has outlived its use. Senior Manager of Planning and Program Directorate at the National Road Safety Authority, Henry Aswini agrees with them. Yes, uh, we all know the state of the Tema Accra uh, motorway, if we can still call it a motorway, because uh, we, uh, we all know when it comes to road classification, we know what a motorway is. Mm. And the road in, its, in the state in which is, it is, it is um, not safe. That one has been attested and agreed by everybody. But if you look at the state in which the road is now, it's not something that, by definition, it should be called a motorway. Both pedestrians and commuters agree that maybe it is time to put zebra crossings and traffic lights on the express highway. We must have a zebra crossing or foot bridge or over crossing here. Car can feel not any time if you don't pay attention. There must be a traffic light and a zebra crossing as well. Maybe they can deploy some. MDTD officers here to intermittently take care of this. Otherwise, we will be doing what we have been doing. I think if somebody like this come here, maybe they keep changing them because somebody died here a, a year ago. Yes, and it was it was he was crossing with a moto in the car not thing. So since then, whenever I reach here, I remember him. He was lying here. And I have to take my time. They found some policemen here. I think eh, I'm thinking they can st stop the cars for us to cross. Though it is a highway, but we will beg the government to give a zebra crossing at some various places on the motorway. We have some more problems, especially uh, Abattoir Bridge. And we have the second problem, the light. We don't have light on the motorway at all. From 18 Junction to uh, 50 Sambor, that place is very dangerous. And some cars cross the, uh, the motorway, it's very dangerous for us. The deteriorating motorway has claimed many lives in the past, but it may claim some more if all these challenges are not quickly resolved. For Joy News, Michael Shalley. Well, so that's the demand of those who apply the Akratama motorway and it's uh, bringing about a new conversation. Well, it's not necessarily new, but uh, you know that walking has long remained an uh, inadequately valued mode of transportation, as we've seen in uh, that report and also in the sub-Saharan uh, uh, region and Africa, uh, many of these countries within the area and in terms of our local policy planning and investment plans as well. Uh, the situation uh, actually manifests
interest in the general lack of walking infrastructure, inadequate lighting and surveillance of pedestrian spaces, which in turn heightens uh, the exposure to risks such as uh, road traffic crashes, in particular pedestrian uh, fatalities, air pollution, noise and crimes, including murder, rape and assault. And despite all of these problems, however, uh, thousands still walk in Ghana albeit the risk of uh, this inevitable risk of uh, the marginalized uh, of course, uh, when it comes to the provision of walkability infrastructure to support their mobility needs as well. So this whole situation is expanding the need for us to have that conversation with Professor Enoch Sam, who is uh, a transport geographer from the Geography Department uh, uh, of uh, the University of Education, Winneba. Prof, uh, thank you so much for joining us here in the studio. And of course, you've just seen that report by my colleague, uh, Michael Ashali talking about the demand of those who ply the Accra Tema motorway. The, the call is that let's try and get some infrastructure on that stretch. Even before we get into what's happening in the sub region itself, this Accra Tema motorway demonstrates the, the situation you've been talking about, correct? Yes, exactly. Mm. Uh, why has this been a neglected area in the sub region? Anyway, like uh, you rightly said, uh, mm. walking in this off is marginalized mm. because, I mean, we don't see the need. And this is at the backdrop of uh, the fact that many of us work, millions work. Even the various trips we undertake uh, start with walking right. and ends with walking. Yeah. yeah. So, strangely, I mean, it baffles our mind why we will, as a nation and as a continent, uh, ignore the needs of people who walk. Pedestrian. And it's interesting, I like the point you made, yeah. make about that being the first mode of transport. Because it, we often ignore it, the fact that we're able to walk every day. We feel, well, it's just part of the normal processes. But it is indeed a form of transport. Exactly. Because even if you're going to take any other form of transport, yeah. you would walk in or either walk out. Yeah. But we've not been paying attention to that. Yeah. For instance, even uh, I mean, in the university or even back at SS. Right. Yeah, let's take the university. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, if we laugh at those who walk to the lecture theatre. Yeah. Yeah. You are always walking, you are always walking. But we tend to forget the health and the environmental benefits of walking. Right? right? Mm -hmm. You are doing a lot of good to your system, your body, as you walk. How be it, how small, but yeah. And environmentally, it's also good. Okay. Because it doesn't pollute. And then even the, the, the resources we need to construct facilities to support working mm -hmm. is relatively cheap compared to what we do for the car. So in our system and uh, in Africa, you travel around, you realize that uh, we are so much visited on the car. So most of our planning mm -hmm. or our cities are transport dependent, motorized transport dependent right. cities. And then it's not strange we are having all these problems. Problem. For instance, you talked about uh, the, the yes, mm -hmm. fatalities all over. If you look at the uh, statistics now, accident statistics in Ghana, mm -hmm. realize that until recently that those uh, the, the Okades are trying to outpace the uh, pedestrian, but right. pedestrians are always in the midst. Stopping the I mean, Yes. So the earlier we do something. Okay, and I'm interested in, 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 in the how, because we all need a solution now. Yeah. Uh, if we're to explore that solution, what should we be looking at, for instance? So, we should prioritize walking mm -hmm. as a mode of transport. Okay. We laugh at those who walk because we feel walking is walking, but if we start looking at it as a mode of transport, mm -hmm. like the car, like the motorbike, mm -hmm. then the conversation changes. Mm -hmm. That is where, that is the beginning of planning, beginning of investment. It's when we plan towards something and when we invest into something, that's, that is where we are making uh, progress. But where we feel, no, but working, I mean, yeah. It's not a big deal, then no, when we have a problem. I mean, but, but in terms of national planning itself, yeah. How, how do we factor that into national planning? Yeah, fortunately, Ghana, I mean, we were in a workshop with uh, some people in uh, the Ministry of Transport, and they did indicate that now we have, uh, uh, as part of the national transport policy, we have something for non-motorized transport. Mm -hmm. So that includes walking and cycling. 
So that, 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 that is also the starting point. Once we have a policy in place for that, then I believe it's not just policy, mm -hmm. but something backing the policy, the resources. It's when we do this that we'll be making progress. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, and also you realize that even in terms of research, mm -hmm. much has not gone into, into walking because walking, I mean, <laughs> we walking, feel like it's yeah, normal. Yes. yes, but when we look at it as a mode of transport, then everything changes. So now, basically, what myself and my team are doing is uh, there's this project on walking. So it has the title "Walking as a Mode of Transport in Unworkable Context." Oh, so, 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 so this is supposed to be a research that yes, you're carrying it's, out. Yes, it's, it's, mm. it's a year project, mm. uh, research project mm. sponsored by uh, Volvo in Sweden. So it's between Ghana and then Nigeria. So we have partners in the University of Education. Mm including myself and Dr. Adami, and then partners in uh, the Federal University of Technology in Oweri, uh, Nigeria, uh, being led by Dr. Chinebule uh, Ozondo. So I happen to be the uh, project lead and the principal investigator. So, so, so for instance, what, what, what are you going to be paying attention to? And I'm sure that you have some initial observations that you're making already about walking. Good. So I did talk about unworkable context. Mm -hmm. so, based on anecdota, evidence, and the fact that we also work ourselves, mm. there are obstacles, impediment to walking, okay. right? Mm -hmm. For instance, the little pavement that has been provided for pedestrians mm -hmm. is now being occupied. By, by, by even the o Okada people. And Okada, <laughs> parked cars, street hawkers. Right. So how do I walk? The small provision for me, somebody is using it. So I'm now forced onto the main road. And there is no provision, no, no barrier, no protection between myself and the motorized transport. So that is where the risk comes in. So uh, is, this an, is this a planning problem, or perhaps it's a fault from the engineering companies that we have all across? Planning. Mm -hmm. I mean, planning push. So you plan. Mm -hmm. And in the process of planning, you have all the tools at your disposal. Mm -hmm. How do I carry about the plan? Yes. So it is in the bigger frame, we are looking at uh, land use planning. Mm -hmm. And with our mind so fixated on motorized transport, we plan accordingly. But when it comes to yeah. walking? You go to Europe, they have made priorities. Walking, mm -hmm. cycling, that is active transport. Right. So they plan accordingly. But we are looking at oh, so We're just planning for the cars. For the cars, exactly. The, the situation may even be, be dire for physically challenged persons. Good. W w I mean, what have you observed in, in terms of their story as well? And funny enough, mm -hmm. we, we completed a project on that and then carrying an extension. Okay. We, are, we are looking at a, a towards a disability inclusive urban transport system. Mm -hmm. Disability inclusive urban right. transport system. Yeah. Uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability mm -hmm. uh, explicitly states that states should be able to provide the facilities so that any other person, including uh, the disabled, yeah. could function effectively in the system mm -hmm. without any assistance. Right? So, invariably, when we are planning for them, we are planning for everybody yeah. the children, the women. Right. So it's something we should be doing holistically. We should, we should pump in things. It shouldn't be the way we are doing. Mm -hmm. And there's this also linked to the issue of uh, uh, land use planning is this concept of 15-minute uh, cities. I don't know whether you've 15 heard minutes. 15-minute cities. 15 minute okay. cities. So what it means is within maximum 15 minutes, I should be able to embark on a round trip. Mm -hmm. And Paris is uh, practicing that. And recently, they won an award for that. So from the start to the end, within a period of 15 minutes, you should be able to cover everything. And usually, but, but certainly that cannot happen in Accra. <laughs> <laughs> so that is planning. Yeah. So usually, it's planned around active transport. We are looking at cycling and walking. Mm -hmm. So if I could walk 15 minutes to and fro and cover everything I need to do, or the major things I need to do at a point, then we are making progress. That is where we put people at the heart of our planning, people at the heart of transport. Mm -hmm. Other than that, 
we'll continue to see what we are seeing. Kaylin? So it, it's funny, <laughs> the thing we are focusing so much on oh, oh. is killing us, and we are still bent on mm -hmm. doing it. We construct wider roads for people to speed and mm -hmm. hit people away. No. We should change the narrative. We should be looking at something different. And, and, and apologies for being fixated on this uh, Accra Tema stretch because yeah. it's one of the major networks that, yeah. that we can talk about, for instance. Uh, there are plans to expand it, for instance, <laughs> make it uh, a four lane, uh, five lane, or whatever it is that the government is promising. Yeah. But, but you say that if we were to do this, do this in an inclusive manner that, that will recognize, for instance, those who would walk and yeah. those who would use, uh, I mean, yeah. the cycles yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you realize we provide infrastructure for the vulnerable road users, okay. including pedestrians. They don't use it. Why? Because of still planning. We don't involve them in their planning. Mm -hmm. So once you involve me, you cater for my needs, I will use it. But if you plan on your own and put the infrastructure there, no, I won't use it because it may not help me in what I'm seeking to do. On the motorway, I mean, so there should be a broader conversation where we involve or we use it, the pedestrian, the vulnerable road user, and look at the way forward. Because at the rate, it's a motorway, which means it's beyond 80 kilometers per hour. Mm -hmm. How fast can you cross? And people, we know people go beyond even 100. Right. How fast can you, or 120, how fast can you cross in order not to be hit? Right. And we are thinking of Four lane, five lane, <laughs> then we should then be we prepared should be for prepared. something. Okay, for, for you, what are the key issues to be on the lookout for uh, from the individual perspective and also from the perspective of uh, those in authority? What, what should we be paying attention to? So we should be paying attention to the needs of the people. Hmm. Here, as far as Sub-Saharan Africa is concerned, walking is the backbone of mobility, our mobility. Mm. So if that is a backbone, then we should support it. Anything we put in place that will support working, that should be it. We are now talking about climate change mitigation. This is a major solution there, because in there we are not polluting. I just, uh, yesterday I read an article, or I reviewed an abstract from, for a conference, and here the person was talking about, in working, we don't, need fuel. In walking, we don't need license. In walking, we don't need registration. So it's free. We don't learn to walk. That is free. So we should also be looking at walking as a mode of transport, just like any other mode of transport we have. And then pumping the resources, the investment, as we do for the other modes of transport. Once we do that, then will we, be going somewhere. And I basically, that, that this, is what the project is. And I believe this would also come with some economic benefits as well. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, once I'm able to do that, so for instance, if I'm, we are killing ourselves, you know how much we spend on crash victims? I mean, a chunk of our, a host, uh, I mean, 1.6% of our budget goes into that. So if we are looking at spending that much, on accident victims. Yes. And aside what the families will spend on and, and the, the grief, the burden, the social economic burden. So if we are able to remove that, I think that money can go into something else. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we need to go. Is, is there anything that the general public would need to know about walking and, and ensuring that we, we include that in, in our planning, yeah. in whatever yeah. infrastructure, walkability infrastructure that we, we need to put in place? Is there any other thing that you would want the general public to know about? Yes, so in, in this sense, what we are basically seeking to do in this project is uh, looking at, one, exploring the habit, the workability practices, habit preferences, and strategies to mitigate the, the, the risks uh, inherent in the system. Mm. That is the unworkable context we are talking about. Mm. So once we are able to know these things, then we will have some lessons going forward. So in the project, we are looking at lessons from Ghana, Cape Coast, and lessons from Oweri, Nigeria, okay. to move forward. So we can base on these lessons for the way forward. So I mean, that, and that is the beauty of research. It brings you to, board, to the fore what it is 
what can so that policy makers can look at what it is mm. and how do we move forward. Other than that, we can be talking, talking, and if it, it wouldn't be evident based, mm. we need that evident base to back to the, the yes, planning. Exactly. I, I guess you, you you're open to more collaborations, and and I mean for anyone who would want to be a part. Yeah, of sure, the sure, process. sure, sure. So in two days' time, we are even. Uh, doing an inception workshop in Cape Coast uh, at the assembly. We are collaborating with the uh, CCMA because it is situated there. And Nigeria will do the same in Oweri. Why? We are cutting support so that whatever we come out with, mm. the policy maker wouldn't be thinking, oh, this is for them. But we will feel this is for us. This is something we need to do. And that is the basis of everything. Okay then, uh, and Prof uh, Professor Sam, thank you for, for joining us uh, here on The Pulse. I'm sure that when you're done with the process, yeah. definitely uh, we'll be here to sure. unpack the details. Sure. Uh, sure. But let's yeah. stay on road safety because a driver of uh, a BMW salon car, believed to be uh, in his late 20s, has died. Uh, whilst uh, a female uh, occupant of that same vehicle is in a very critical condition after the car uh, they were traveling in got involved in an accident uh, at the Tetekwashi interchange. Uh, my colleague James Kusiavaji was there a while ago and now reports. So this morning at about 9 a.m. we were told that three cars uh, including a tipper truck, a sprinter, a trotter car as well as a BMW saloon car have been involved in an accident here on the motorway at the Tetequashi interchange. According to eyewitnesses, in fact, according to the driver of the Sprinter, the BMW saloon car, which was headed towards Tema, actually blasted a tie and rolled over uh, the middle of the road onto the other side of the road, crashing into the front of the tipper truck, leading to the accident. Uh, let's, let's quickly speak to some of uh, the drivers of the three vehicles to tell us exactly what happened here this morning. We're heading from the, the motorway to Jolo Junction. So when we're coming, there is this car, private car, jumping from his lane to our lane. So what happened was that I was in the inner lane and then the tipper bus was at the outer lane. So the tipper was ahead of me. So the, when he, it happened that way, the tipper, it hit the tipper. So I quickly turned my steering to the other side. So I overtook the tipper a little. So after I saw that the tipper was pushing me to where you've seen the car. Yeah. So the uh, BMW was actually heading from Jowlu Junction to the, motorway. to the motorway. Do you know what really happened that he had to cross the road, jump over the uh, the middle of the road too? Oh, no, I don't know actually, but what I heard was that he blasted a tire. So he, uh, the speed that he was coming with led him to jump to our lane. Uh, that is what happened. So did he did he hit you or the tipper driver? He hit the tipper driver. So because of the dust that was, uh, I couldn't see anything anymore. So I was just controlling, controlling. And then what I re I saw was that the tipper was also coming towards my direction, and then he hit me, and then we all went to the gutter. Has, has anyone died? Uh, no, actually, but I have heard that they said the, this, this private car, the driver has had an injury, seriously. So I don't know if it has been confirmed yet that he has passed out. I don't know. So in, in all, how many people are involved now? How many people were in, the, in your car? About five. About five? Yes. Are they all okay? Yeah, they are okay. So they have all gone to pick the car and then they have gone back. Road Someone 
they said one of the driver is dead. Um, we had four. Yeah. But I've, I've sent uh, all of my mates to uh, 37 hospital. Yeah. By yourself, you are okay? Yeah, after that, I'll go to hospital. So, as you can see behind me, the accident has led to traffic situation on the road here, but the Ghana Police Service are here trying to control the traffic situation as the cows are pulled out of the middle of the road and that is the situation one person we are told have been reportedly confirmed dead at the 37 military hospital the rest including two victims of the bmw car five persons in the sprinter and four persons in the tipa truck the rest have all been conveyed to the 37 military hospital for treatment for their various degrees of injuries reporting for joy news my name is james kwesi Aveji.